All right, hi everyone. Thank you so much for uh, joining us for today's webinar, Identity Theft in the Context of Family Violence. This webinar is brought to you by the National Center for Victims of Crime in partnership with the Identity Theft Resource Center. And it's been put together as part of the National Identity Theft Victim Assistance Network, the NITVAN program, funded by the Office for Victims of Crime. My name is Laura Cook, and I'm the Director of Training and Technical Assistance with the National Center, and I've been working with the NITVAN program for about the past year. At the bottom of your screen, you will see both a chat and a Q&A box. Uh, for the chat box, if presenters have questions for the audience, that's what you'll use that for. Uh, with the Q&A box, that's it for if you have questions for the presenters. Uh, so any questions you have during the presentation, you can go ahead and type them there. We're going to address questions at the end of each section. We've got the presentation split into about three sections. And so we'll be asking questions at that time um, and going through a little bit of Q&A during this portion. So before we get started, I'd like to briefly introduce our presenters. Uh, Carla Sanchez Adams is a board certified, is board certified by the Texas Board of Legal Specialization in Consumer and Commercial Law. She's a managing attorney with the Texas Rio Grande Legal Aid Incorporated, PRLA, and is a board member for the National Association of Consumer Advocates. Carla assists low-income Texans on issues related to debt collection, credit reporting, auto fraud, debt management, and other consumer-related disputes. She leads a team of advocates who utilize a holistic approach to achieving economic security for victims of crime, including survivors of family violence, sexual assault, and human trafficking. This advocacy includes litigation when consumer rights have been violated, representation and assistance with federal tax liability, financial empowerment, and cross-training collaboration with other attorneys within TRLA and its partner organizations. <coughs> Carla is the chair of the Texas Coalition on Coerced Debt, which is a new federally funded initiative that aims to build awareness of coerced debt and identity theft, develop solutions to address the problem, and create connections between different groups in Texas. Our second presenter, well, our first presenter rather, is Stephanie James. She is a Crime Victims Justice Corp Equal Justice Works Fellow at the Texas Regal, Rio Grande Legal Aid, where she works primarily representing victims of identity theft and financial fraud. Prior to the fellowship, Stephanie primarily practiced family law at TRLA, representing victims of vi domestic violence and sexual assault in civil cases. As part of her current fellowship, Stephanie continues to provide services to victims of domestic violence who are also victims of course debt committed by their abusers. She also works representing both victims and victim service providers in asserting privacy protections in response to subpoenas in both civil and criminal courts. Stephanie earned her JD from the University of Texas School of Law and her BA from St. Edwards University. So thank you so much to both Stephanie and Carla for joining us today to share your expertise. Um, and with that, I will turn the presentation over to Stephanie and I'm gonna share my screen with you all so that you can see the slides here in just a second. Hi, uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you all uh, for joining us. Um, before we get started, um, if you can all just take a couple of seconds to type in the chat box um, what your role is, if you are a victim advocate or law enforcement officer or, or an attorney, if you can just take a couple of minutes and, and please type that in the chat box. We just want to um, get an idea of, of who's joining us today um, and to discuss this topic. Um, so again, thank you for joining us. Um, I know that both Carla and I are very excited to be talking about the subject of economic abuse and coerced debt um, in the context of intimate partner violence. Um, and it's a subject that we're both passionate about. Um, we believe that as protections for victims of domestic violence um, continue to grow nationwide, um, we are all trying to understand the special uh, challenges that victims face in an effort to ensure that we are uh, providing holistic services um, to our clients. And so when it comes to economic abuse, um, this is truly an area where we believe that we can help set up our clients uh, for future success uh, long after um, the abusive uh, relationship uh, has ended. Next slide. And so it's our hope um, that after watching uh, today's webinar, 
Um, you will gain an additional understanding of what exactly is economic abuse and coerced debt. Um, we will provide a general overview of the legal remedies uh, for victims of coerced debt. And um, this does include some recent changes um, to Texas law, but we also um, discuss uh, federal protections available uh, to dispute transactions and accounts that are a result of economic abuse. Um, and lastly, we will talk about our work as part of the Texas Coalition on Coerced Debt um, and a web-based toolkit um, that we have recently published that's now available to everybody um, to victims of coerced debt. And that website is www.financialabusehelp.org. Um, Slide. Um, so let's talk about economic abuse in general. Um, why even talk about it? Um, so here I have this uh, graphic that was published by the Nat National uh, Center on Domestic Violence um, and its purpose is to help us understand um, the overall pattern of abusive and violent behaviors um, that are used by batterers um, to establish power um, and control over their partner. Um, and even though um, these may not be easily identified, uh, usually they are used in conduction and they uh, establish a power of intimidation and control. And so as advocates, especially uh, family law practitioners, uh, it is important to uh, recognize that economic abuse is, um, is just one type of abuse that a victim may be ex um, experiencing. Um, so as a result, it's important to, to screen for this uh, sort of abuse. Um, especially when we are attempting to, to build the case that, um, that there has been domestic violence in, in, in the relationship. Um, and I think that this is something that's really underutilized right now in family courts, but it can really be an effective uh, means for us to be able to uh, convince a judge or a jury of really what sort of dynamics existed in, in that particular um, relationship. One minute. Sorry about that. Forgot to put on my do not disturb. Um, and so we know economic abuse in general um, is that when uh, batterers control the victim's finances to prevent them from accessing resources, working, or maintaining control of earnings, achieving self-sufficiency, um, and gaining uh, financial independence. And so what we know that this eventually translates to, um, we know that if we have a client that is attempting to uh, leave an abusive relationship, um, and um, they essentially need access to good credit. And we know um, that good credit provides access to goods and services that the individual will, will need in order to leave the relationship um, for good. Um, and so when there has been economic abuse and um, the individual does not have access to good credit, that indi individual may also not have access to be able to obtain things such as a car loan um, or to be able to obtain affordable housing, being able to uh, connect their utilities. Um, so this is how um, it is just extremely important for, uh, for us to be screening these issues uh, because um, having bad credit as a result of economic abuse and experienced by an intimate partner um, can really hurt a victim in the long run and, you know, prevent her from, from leaving um, the relationship at all. Next slide. Okay, um, so what is a uh, coerced debt? So we like to explain um, that coerced debt occurs when an abuser in a violent relationship obtains credit in the victim's name uh, via fraud um, or duress. And so what makes coerced debt particularly harmful is that it, this debt stays with the victim um, for, for quite a while, long past the relationship has ended, um, and that family courts are really ineffective at uh, addressing uh, this sort of um, coerced debt um, because, um, at least in Texas, um, a court may order somebody as part of a divorce to be responsible for paying the debts but we have contract law um, principles um, that, that really govern um, um, and override um, what a divorce uh, judge may, may order. Um, and so we know that the traditional um, defenses um, to consumer law don't, uh, won't really uh, work in this uh, unless we understand um, why, how coerced debt is functioning in the intimate partner relationship. Next slide. 
Okay, so cohort debt, again, is any non-consensual credit-related transaction that occurs um, within an abusive, intimate relationship. And so this can take many forms. Um, this can take the form of um, a partner obtaining credit um, in a partner's name outright. Um, it can be without their knowledge or consent, um, maybe able to take a mortgage. Uh, the most one that we see most common is um, um, obtaining credit cards and loans. In, in the victim's name um, without their knowledge or of consent um, or putting bills um, in a partner's name. Um, and so what we know is that uh, what all these things have in common is that the victim has lost control over the ability to make uh, financial uh, decisions for herself. And so there are uh, three mechanisms of course debt. The first one is a uh, fraud. So it's just outright using the survivor's personal identifying information um, without their consent or knowledge to obtain a loan or a credit in, in her name. Um, there's of course a coercion uh, using demands or threats um, to lead uh, the survivor to take on debt that she wouldn't have otherwise incurred. Um, we, we Carla and I have had clients where um, there's been unfortunate, you know, severe physical abuse, um, where, I mean, the threats are just outright, um, you know, if you don't give me money, you know, I, I will hurt you. And of course, it's also creating a situation where the victim knows what's going to happen if um, that individual doesn't get what they want. Um, we, we had a client where um, she knew that if he was drinking, he, um, would always ask her for money, and if he didn't have money, um, you know, he was he was going to be physically abusive towards her. Um, and so those are really difficult cases. Um, and so she would have to incur um, uh, a loan, a uh, debt, to be able to make sure that she always had some money on hand to be able to, to provide to him. And so we also have manipulation. Um, so it's deliberately managing conditions or information uh, to lead the survivor. Um, to take on debt that she would not have otherwise incurred. Um, so because one or more or several of these may be present in any given situation, um, these cases are, are really complex and it's important to understand again um, the dynamics of these relationships um, where, where there's family history of family violence and really understand that at the end of the day um, it's about power and control. Um, and to be able to explain that to a judge or, or to a creditor that's attempting to collect on, on a debt, um, as advocates, it's really um, important to help us understand how, how that's linked. And so um, just quickly, uh, just some statistics um, that um, we believe that this area is, is um, there's not a whole lot of research in this area. Um, but what we do have so far, um, there was a study um, that's currently in the process of being uh, published. It's a National Domestic Violence Hotline Survey um, by our partners at the University of Texas um, at Austin. And um, just to talk a little bit about the sample. Um, so part of the sample was um, 1,823 English-speaking female callers um, that were between the ages of 18 uh, that were 18 and older, um, and they were asked 10 questions about, um, next slide, about uh, the effects um, of coerced debt, um, and it was administered by, by staff at the National Domestic Violence Hotline. Um, and so this graphic just shows that the majority, 38% of the participants were between the ages of 25 and 35. Um, the next slide, um, the majority of the partic participants, 46% were white, um, and so when um, they were asked, uh, have you ever found out about debt or bills you owe that an intimate partner put in your name without you knowing, 22% answered yes, um, that they had in fact found out that um, they had found out about this debt that they um, didn't know. Um, and so, next slide. Don't remember if we can go to um, two slides forward, please. Um, when asked uh, whether there was co coercion, has an intimate partner ever convinced or pressured you to borrow money or buy something on credit um, when you didn't want to? And um, was there a threat or a consequence for saying no? 43% responded, percent responded yes. Um, coercion, um, the next slide, please. 
Um, has an intimate partner ever convinced or pressured you to borrow money or buy something on credit when you didn't want to? Um, and was there a threat of consequence for saying no? So 43% responded yes. So again, all of these statistics show that you know this really is happening. Um, and so we really need to start um, screening uh, for these issues. Um, so, Carla, do you recall um, what the statistic was? Um, so there was also the, um, whether there was a threat of physical harm as part of that coercion. And uh, that was 32.5% um, indicated that there was physical harm. And so if we can uh, fast forward to um, 519. Yes. Has an intimate partner ever kept financial information from you? 64% um, um, said yes. Um, and National Domestic Violence Hotline participants, 71% um, um, again said, said yes. And so the next slide. Um, and so we know that women whose intimate partner uh, kept financial information from them were 3.6 times more likely uh, to experience um, coerced debt. And so again, we come back to really at the heart of the matter, what this is about is, is about power and control. Um, and so we need to be able to identify um, what, what this looks like. Um, so asking questions to our clients such as, um, do you have possession uh, of credit cards that, in, or, that are in your name? Um, those are all key questions to make um, while making um, an assessment as to whether um, uh, somebody has experienced um, economic abuse. And so once, um, you know, there, there has been economic abuse, um, um, you know, how many of these people are being contacted by, by creditors or bill collectors? 63% um, of, of victims stated that they were in fact being um, contacted, um, which just adds um, to the re-traumatization that these clients are facing because long after the relationship has ended, in many times uh, uh, years, um, they are reminded of, of the abuse, the economic abuse, uh, when they get um, a letter from a debt collector in the mail or um, you know, worse, a, a threatening, harassing uh, phone call from an aggressive debt collector. Um, and so next slide. So um, the, the effects of course debt, um, we absolutely know that um, there are credit report, there are problems with uh, clients credit reports um, is the one that we, that we see the most. Um, and of course, just overall, it's just a lack of financial um, independence, right? So they are so dependent on the abuser because they've created a situation uh, where uh, the victim has to be dependent on, on the abuser economically, either because they have actual physical possession of their, of their uh, financial documents, or because simply they've created a situation where they no longer have access to credit um, so that she's able to obtain the goods and services that, that she needs to be able to, to leave that, that relationship, right? And so she experiences uh, financial hardship that can become an additional barrier uh, to her being able to, to leave uh, the relationship for good. Um, and the ways that, um, that that this is really challenging, especially for family law practitioners. And I experienced this in representing people um, to obtain protective orders or divorces um, or custody agreements, um, is that um, if we're not screening for these issues later on, uh, um, early on, um, we're not able to set up our client um, to be in the best position possible um, to again, um, so that she can move forward uh, from the abuse. And so um, when asked whether a uh, credit report or credit score has been hurt by the actions of an intimate partner, 46% um, um, said yes. But um, however, 14% um, that said no, they said that they were also unsure 
Um, and what we've been trying to do, part of the work that Carla and I do, um, is to educate uh, victim services providers um, to help clients pull their credit reports as soon as possible so that the, they become aware of um, the harms earlier uh, rather, than, rather than later. Um, so that we can be, begin taking steps to help help fix the situation um, before it's too late. Um, when asked, uh, has your credit, credit report or credit score been hurt by the actions um, of, of an intimate partner? We know that women with coerced debt are uh, six times more likely uh, to have their credit hurt by, by, by an abusive partner. And does anybody have any questions about that section? Um, so I will now turn it over uh, to Carla. Sorry about that. I'm trying to, um, having some connect connectivity issues. Hi, everyone. So I know that that was a lot that uh, Stephanie talked about. So some takeaways or just some things to remember is that uh, coerced debt is a specific type of identity theft that happens in intimate partner violence relationships. And so for all of you that work in the space of identity theft, you have one component that is really the traditional identity theft. You have uh, you know, debt that was taken out without the survivor's knowledge or permission. But then you have this second component, which is that that was taken out um, through um, through threats of violence, through manipulation, through what we you know what is called coercion in the legal community, and so the challenge that we had found in in working in this area of law is that um, you had all of these traditional uh, protections under identity theft, both in federal and state law, that applied if the victim had been um, I'm sorry, survivor had been a victim of, of coerced debt in that traditional identity theft sense. They didn't know about it. They didn't give any permission. But in the second sense, those that did it under duress, under coercion, because they were scared, there was a threat of violence, which is all the statistics that Stephanie talked about, there weren't any remedies for them at law. And the reason for that was be is because the bank or the lender is uh, extending credit or money or you know all of these things um, without uh, knowing that, and so they're an innocent party. Um, and so I'm going to talk about in the next slides. Um, if you can change slides, please. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk about these protections here that are available to all victims of identity theft. So for those of you guys that work in the space that are lawyers um, or advocates, um, so you can know about these. These are tools that you can use. And also talk about, um, you know, for us, there's, there's a, we, um, as a coalition, uh, one of the things that we were able to do is by, you know, sharing ideas and experiences, um, we were able to have somebody who's on the coalition who works in the policy space actually make changes to our law to enable victims of coerced debt that fit the second group, those that um, had the, um, the debt as a result of coercion and not the traditional identity theft, um, to now be included in the definition of identity theft. So in our state, if you are a victim of coerced debt, both categories, now you can be treated as an identity theft victim and have um, be able to avail yourself of all of these protections here that you see. So for us, it has expanded the remedies available to victims of coerced debt. Now that may not be the case for, for some of you in some of your states, but for those of you that work in the policy area, that might be something to consider and to think about as we're sharing some of these. Um, and for those of you that work in the traditional identity theft space, and this is obviously really helpful for you to know, um, so you can issue spot, as Stephanie had talked about, to see these are, um, you, know, and, you know, for all of our clients that are victims of DV, um, you know, kind of screen for some of these issues, issue spot them, and then be able to either refer to folks that do this space, either private consumer attorneys or legal aid attorneys, um, or to even help them in some of these processes uh, which most of them it require certain disputes. So I'll go ahead and start with, um, you know, here that I'm going to go through each of them um, in, in brief detail because obviously I can't give you a huge crash course on every law because <laughs> we'd be here all day. So um, for the first one is the FCRA or the Fair Credit Reporting Act. 
And this is a really helpful law because it does remedy and it does address first and foremost um, that problem that Stephanie talked about of, of credit reporting. So as she mentioned, um, in our current day and age, credit reporting is, it is in increasingly important. So it's not just to get a credit card, it's not just to get um, a mortgage loan, but now it's to get utilities, um, to get a cell phone, um, you know, transportation if you need a car, housing if you're applying for, um, you know, to, to rent an apartment, they run a background check. Um, through a tenant screening bureau, which falls under credit reporting. If you apply for a job, they run a background check, which is an you know, employer screening background, and that's under the FCRA as well. And so all of that encompasses, if you're opening a checking account, they have specialty consumer reporting agencies for those as well. So credit is increasingly important. And as, as Stephanie mentioned, damage to credit prevents a survivor from being able to be economically stable and to be able to leave that abusive relationship. So if we can stop the block, the reporting of the debt, that's the first step that we can take and prevent future um, debt being taken out in her name without her permission, um, then we can start to help achieve that economic stability. So this law in particular talks about that blocking. If you're a victim of identity theft, oops, I have a question. Um, let me check that. Um, well, I can't see it, but I'm sure it'll pop up later. Um, uh, Carla, it, it was, um, is there examples of legislation that would be helpful? And I think that's what we're going over right now. Um, yeah, so if it's, if it's regarding the legislation that I mentioned here in Texas, I will be going through it later on in the presentation so you can get an idea of how we address it um, here in our state. And maybe that'll, you know, and, and obviously if you have more questions, we can chat on the phone afterwards and I can connect you to some folks that are doing policy work in this area um, countrywide. Um, but as far as, as, you know, I'm going to go through the, the credit reporting aspect right now. Uh, so hopefully that will answer some of your questions. But so um, under the FCRA, uh, victims of identity theft are allowed and entitled to a block of all information that should not be on their report as a result of identity theft. What that block does, it doesn't delete that information from the file, their file, but it prevents it from, from showing up on a report that a um, creditor or somebody who's going to extend credit or an employer or, you know, a landlord, prospective landlord, sees. So they will not be able to see that information at all on the report. Um, in order to get that block, you have to have what's called an identity theft report. And that is defined by the statute as, you know, an official report that is given to, to law enforcement, either state, um, federal, or local um, law enforcement agency. Um, and so the FTC identity theft affidavit, which hopefully all of you guys working in the space know about, that should be sufficient for, um, for getting the block. But I have seen in practice that um, often it's not the case, and we generally do both a police report as well uh, as an FTC identity theft affidavit. But under the law, having those um, entitles a victim of identity theft to a block. You can also dispute that information and request to be deleted, um, but the block is just it's quicker, and it is like, you know, you do that, you, do, you can do them simultaneously, but the block for sure is something that you are entitled to as a victim of identity theft. In addition, you can request a security freeze, which is now free, um, and that prevents future um, accounts from being opened. Um, and so that, uh, once you request that, you have to do it from each of the bureaus, and once you do that, then they give you a PIN, and the survivor needs to have access to that at all times because she can temporarily lift that freeze when she wants to take out credit for herself um, or apply for a job or something like that. But those are the, the FCRA um, is is the law that helps with the reporting aspect, and so it's something that we utilize in our practice all the time. Um, next slide. So the second kind of set of laws that protect victims of identity theft are debt collection laws, and there's federal law which applies to everybody um, on, the, on the call, and then there's state-specific laws. So I obviously don't know all of the state-specific laws. Um, I can talk about Texas, but I will limit it to just the federal law for now. And that is uh, for debt collectors in particular. So it's not an original creditor, so it wouldn't be that credit card company. It wouldn't be that payday lender. It wouldn't be 
um, that mortgage lender or the car lender, but it would be a debt collector. So generally medical debt automatically goes to debt collectors, past um, landlord or housing debt will go, credit cards after they've been charged off and sold will go to debt collectors. And so what a victim has the right to do is to dispute the debt um, under the FDCPA and they cannot continue to report it. Um, they can't continue to collect it. There's certain things they can't do um, and failure to do so um, means that you can bring a lawsuit against them. And the great thing about the suit is that it is mandatory attorney's fees and um, $1,000 statutory damages. So of course it's incredibly helpful for um, private attorneys who want to um, take these cases. They don't have to do it pro bono. They're great cases. And um, it's something that you guys can issue spot and then refer out to the private bar if you don't do it in house. Second, uh, next slide, please. So the FCBA or the Fair Credit Billing Act. I know there's a lot of acronyms, so I'm sorry about that. But the Fair Credit Billing Act is um, the law that governs credit cards. So this uh, applies to all credit cards when it's still within um, ownership of the creditor. So in, in many of our cases, um, you know, our clients first find out about the debt because after they separate from the, the abuser, they start getting mail again. That's one of the common ways that the economic abuse happens is they keep financial information, don't let them get access to the mail. And so, for example, I had a client who found um, after she separated, ended up getting a bunch of statements for credit cards and didn't know what they were. Um, another very common way that, that Stephanie mentioned was, of course, pulling the credit reports. But when they get the mail from a creditor, um, it's a billing statement, um, they have rights under this law, Fair Credit Billing Act, to dispute um, the account as well as charges. And so this also falls into, for example, if your client had an existing account that was hers, but he used it without her knowledge or permission to bring up, um, you know, bring up charges and debt and things, then she can dispute just those charges as well. So you can either just dispute the unauthorized charges or the whole account under this law. And there's two components to it. Um, I'm just going to talk about the unauthorized use provision because it is um, more holistic in its remedy. And, and what I mean by that is that there's no time period of when you have to report um, or dispute, I'm sorry, the charges or the account. Um, under some of the other provisions, you have to do it within a certain time period so it's more restrictive. Um, and then they have to investigate. They have to let you know that they're investigating it. Um, and they have to, um, you know, they can't hold you liable for more than $50. Um, and they have to let you know why. Um, and, and one of the very, very key things that, that is, um, you know, in, in the law and case law is that they can't just tell you, sorry, you benefited from this um, because you were married to this person or you were in a relationship with this person. Um, so too bad, so sad, there was no fraud. Um, and that happens a lot, and we sue on it a lot. Um, and so um, I, that's one of the things just to, to know about, that you have that right to dispute it. And, and oftentimes we find that when survivors do call and say, hey, this is, my, um, this is not mine, I don't know about this, I, can you close this, they'll say, well, there's pending charges, we can't close it. Sorry, but they don't inform them of their right to dispute it or that they have to investigate it or anything like that. Um, next slide, please. So here's case law that uh, I was mentioning about um, that, this, you know, there's Ohio, there's Texas, and there's New Jersey that talk about um, this, this idea that just because you were in a, in a relationship or you were married doesn't mean that there is consent to use this card. So the Fair Credit Billing Act hinges on this idea of was there consent, either implied or apparent, um, that permitted the person to use the card or to open the account, et cetera, et cetera. And so it's a case-by-case -case fact scenario where they really do um, look at, uh, you know, what were the circumstances? Like did that person, um, you know, in, in each of these cases they're a little bit different, but for example, in the Dillard case, the very first one, the couple was married, separated, not yet divorced. And um, she was using the credit card account to, to that the wife was in this case um, on on his credit card, and so he disputed it, and they responded and said, "We have concluded that because you were married at the time, that um, you know the charges are yours." Bye bye. <laughs> and so the court said that's not sufficient. That is a conclusory statement. There's no. It's ambiguous. There's no proof. You actually have to investigate this. Um, and so. 
in, you know, they violated the Fair Credit Billing Act by not actually doing an investigation. Um, and in the other two cases, the, the Lumber case, um, there was a girl who was in a relationship with a boy. They broke up. He took her card. He used it at a lumber company, and um, they kind of said the same thing. Sorry, you know, he had permission to use it. And so in court, they're asking um, the, the company, uh, one of the representatives from the lumber company, well, what gave you the idea? Did, did he have a signature by her? Did she appear in person? Like, what gave you... What made you think that he had authority um, to use this? And, and of course, they didn't have anything to say. So, um, you know, all of those charges should not have been issued to her. Um, there is also this case that I've mentioned at the bottom, which is a criminal case here in Texas. You may want to think about whether your state has a similar, um, not just identity theft, but a, another type of crime. Here we have it. It's called credit card abuse. Um, next slide, please. So here is uh, our definition um, under our penal code of credit card abuse or debit card. And so it is it's a crime. Here it's actually a felony. And if it's done to the elderly, it's a felony in the third degree. Um, and it's essentially, you know, somebody commits this crime if with the intent to obtain a benefit fraudulently, they present or use a credit card or debit card with knowledge that it hasn't been issued to that person and it was um, not used with the effective consent of the, of the cardholder. And the nice thing about this law is effective consent um, embodies coerced debt, both components. So it's not just identity theft, didn't know about it, there was no permission, but it's also effective consent, meaning it wasn't done under threat or, or duress or coercion. And so you might want to check your state statutes to see if there is something comparable in your state. Um, and, and that is a way of being able to get, um, you know, a, a police report and also to have it potentially prosecuted. And that way it's even more showing to those creditors that um, this person didn't have authority to use it. Next slide, please. So here's what um, the person that asked about policy, what about changes. Um, here's what we did and here's how, you know, it affected, um, you know, survivors for us. We, uh, under the previous laws I had mentioned before, the identity theft was narrowly defined as just um, consent, so without their knowledge or permission. What we did was we changed the definition of identity theft to now include effective consent, which you see there highlighted in red. Next slide, please. Next slide, thank you. So what is effective consent? As you see, here's the definition of it, but it, it includes now induced by force, threat, or fraud. So that encompasses, like I said, both categories of coerced debt. But it, um, and for us, again, just want to stress that coerced debt happens in the context of family violence. It's not just a dating relationship, but it's also foster youth. It's also elderly, um, you know, when it happens, like a child for a, of um, an elderly parent does it. Um, or a relative or something like that. So it encompasses not just family violence, the dating aspect, but the broader definition of family violence. And so this, you know, we had um, folks that were on board from not just um, the DV community, but also the elderly community and, you know, foster youth and things like that. So this is what we did in our state. Um, next, next slide, please. Um, and what that did, and why we did that was not just because it meant that now all of our, um, you know, coerced debt uh, victims can now get a police report and then, as a result of having that police report, be able to dispute under the FCRA and FDCPA and all of the statutes, the alphabet soup that I mentioned earlier. And now they, under state law, they're an identity theft victim, so they can get all the protections that I mentioned before. But like I would say not more importantly, just as importantly, um, they can now get a court order under our state statute for identity theft, um, which is a very robust and holistic statute. So what it is is um, you file suit, there's no defendant, there's no opposing party, you file suit and you request that a judge order that you are a victim of identity theft and in that order it lists all of the information that should not be that um, the victim. So it's public records, um, so if there was like arrest um, under the name of the victim that wasn't them, uh, convictions that again somebody used their driver's license and it shouldn't have been them, um, as well as all the debt, and that's in an order and it is a court order and it is you know indisputable. 
So it's not, uh, you know, creditors, agencies who are saying this is you, there is a court order saying no, it's not. Um, and so now they can avail themselves of that protection. And um, again, you're probably not in Texas, and so you want to check if there is a state identity theft statute in your, um, you know, where you are, and as a policy consideration, think about is this something that we already have? If not, can we get something like that? Can we get stronger protections under our identity theft statute? Next slide, please. So another law that um, is helpful um, and can be used for identity theft victims is the TCPA, or the Telephone Consumer Protection Act. And what that law does is it essentially governs like unwanted texts, faxes, <laughs> phone calls, and it hinges on this idea of consent. Did the, and it has to be used by an auto-dialed um, system. And so, um, you know, it's basically if those robocalls that are auto-dialed and recorded and, you know, um, they are calling a client about um, an, a, a, an account that they never took out because they, it wasn't theirs, then um, they could be, um, excuse me, they could likely, that collector or creditor or whoever, if they're using that auto-dial system, um, would be liable under the statute. And it is up to $500 per call. So if they're calling them all the time and harassing them, then likely your client would have not just the debt collection violations or the Fair Credit Billing Act violations, but also this one. And so they work in tandem. And it is one of these things, again, that issue spotting, realizing you don't have to be an expert, you don't have to be the one who brings this claim, but just knowing that it exists so that you can then refer out to, um, to private attorneys or legal aid attorneys or folks in your community that are doing this kind of work. Next slide, please. This next law is also extremely helpful because if you're an advocate or someone who's not a lawyer, you can at least tell a client that this law applies and tell them what to do. Um, and so this law is the Electronic Funds Transfer Act, and it has to do with bank accounts and debit cards. And so you will often hear, we've heard um, client stories where they say, he stole my debit card, and then he did X, Y, and Z with it, right? Um, you know, made charges to it, or, um, you know, to re, um, sorry, withdrew money from the ATM, or, you know, fill in the blank. And so um, this federal law uh, governs that use, um, and all the different types of accounts checking, savings, et cetera. Um, and it does define, so it has to fall within the, what an electronic funds transfer is. Um, so it's not, it doesn't apply to checks, unfortunately, but we have other laws for that. Um, but it's basically, you know, um, if you look at the statute, it's, it's mostly all the stuff that happens to our clients falls under the electronic funds transfer. Next slide, please. So here are the different um, categories of those that I, that I list out. I won't go through all of them. You can see them there. Y'all can read. Um, but there, the important thing is that when it happens with an ATM, the um, reason this is important is because there's cameras at the ATM. And so if you're um, the next step of this, uh, if you go to the next slide, please, um, is disputing it. And they have to actually investigate it. And they can't say, sorry, it was you, if there's a video camera footage and it's clearly not you. Um, you know, if you're female and it is a male, um, not you. Um, so they can't just say, sorry, too bad, so sad. Um, the, the important thing or the kind of um, one of the barriers about this is that you have to dispute it within the 60 days of, of when it's put on your bank account statement. So whether you get it in the mail or electronically, it has to be within 60 days of when that charge, that withdrawal, whatever it was, comes out. So it's, it can be a charge also like, again, um, somebody using it to buy something online, um, that's called a point of sale, or like in a store or something like that. Um, those, those charges, similar to disputing it with the Fair Credit Billing Act, this is disputing it under, with your bank directly, because it's from your bank account, not a credit card. Um, so the, the dispute can be verbal, so if they call them and tell them, um, you know, that totally qualifies. As a lawyer, of course, we always say we prefer things to be written because we want a paper trail to show that they got it and they didn't do anything. Um, and obviously, if you have a police report, it's extremely helpful to show they're investigating it, they reported it, they're not just making it up and trying to get out of the money. Um, but there is helpful things here about what the notice has to include, so obviously enough for them to investigate it, the account number, their name, which the, what error actually is there. Um, and uh, they, they, you know, again, that's why I think a police report is helpful um, to show also, like, this is the reason for the error. I'm a victim of identity theft. 
Um, and so they have to, the bank has to investigate it, um, and um, they have to let them know of the results of the investigation. Next slide, please. So they have these 45 days to investigate, and then they have to either correct it, you know, if, if they find out that there was an error, they have to correct it within one business day. Um, if they don't think that um, that there was an error, in other words, if they say, sorry, this was you, um, then they have to send an explanation of the findings within three business days of the conclusion of that investigation. Um, so I, I just put here for the lawyers on, on the webinar, you know, that, that you can get up to trouble damages. So if you, you know, again, in, in those cases where there's an ATM and there's a video and it's clear that it's not the person, um, you can show that this was knowingly and willfully concluding that it wasn't in error when it should have been, um, then you can get up to triple damages. So that's obviously helpful in addition to attorney's fees and things like that. Next slide, please. Um, so kind of summary of all of that that I just said, because I know it's quite a bit, and you're probably sitting there thinking, whoa, it's a lot of information. Um, the summary of it, I would say, especially if you're in the role of like whether you're an AG or a prosecutor or an attorney, is don't automatically think, oh, because they're married or it was their partner or their spouse or, you know, that, that there's nothing we can do. That's it. Because um, clearly there's not, and, and the law, is, is, um, as I just presented it, shows that there, there are options and remedies available. Um, help them, if you're an advocate um, or a lawyer, help them get a police report. We have found, and I think that um, you will, Stephanie might talk about this later on, we have found that uh, sometimes law enforcement doesn't get it, and so they think, okay, you were married, um, and you, you know, because you were married, that there's nothing we can do, it's a civil issue, go figure it out. And they won't actually do a police report. And so we can't avail ourselves of the block if we can't get a police report. Um, and so we, we have had to advocate on behalf of them, you know, talk to law enforcement, tell them, here's the law, here's why we need it. Please treat them this way. Um, specifically in one of our cases, we had launch. Okay, so she is a victim of DV, um, and he also had sexually abused um, the daughter that was not of the marriage, and she went to police to report that um, that it was, um, sorry, I see a question, so I got distracted, but I'll get to it in a bit. Um, so to, to report that, that she was a victim of identity theft because we told her we needed to get a police report. And, um, you know, the, the responding officer said, well, how do I know if I, if I pull up uh, the video footage of all the places that these cards were used, that it's not going to be you on, on video, and you know that you can, um, you know, we'll, we'll prosecute you for that. So she was already scared, and they're telling her they're going to prosecute her, and she says, and they asked her who it was, and she said it was her husband, and they said, well, I'm going to call him up on the phone and tell him about this, and she had said, I'm concerned for my safety, I'm a victim of domestic violence, please don't call him, I don't want him to know that I'm here, and yet he proceeded to do so. Um, so this is kind of the advocacy part of helping the victims um, to, you know, to get police support safely and also taking safety considerations into account. Um, and then finally, the, the last point here is to help, um, you know, advocate for in your state, whether it's identity theft or another similar crime, like I mentioned, credit card abuse, help them to, you know, to make, elevate this issue so that um, more local county attorneys or district attorneys are prosecuting it and taking it as a, uh, seriously as a crime. Next slide, please. Next, okay. Um, so I will, well, you've got to keep clicking on it for all the arrows to pop up. Um, and while she's doing that, I will um, answer this question, which is, sorry, uh, for some reason I cannot see. So there, there was, uh, don't worry, if there's a tech question, um, Jazz will handle it. But there was a question about debt related to medical bills due to physical abuse. Uh, are there remedies available aside from civil litigation to a victim to clean up their credit after it's gone to collection? Yeah, so there's um, a couple of things on medical debt related to abuse. So one of the things that I would recommend you do is reach out to your AG's office. Here in Texas, we have something called crime victims compensation. And so um, that pays off the medical debt. Any medical debt is covered by CBC. Um, and if the, the hospitals cannot bill over what is paid by CBC, we have had cases where, for example, um, the hospital is supposed to, to provide the AG's office and CBC with 
the bill um, an itemized bill and they were delaying doing that. And so as a result of their delay, they weren't getting paid. So they sued our client and got a court order um, because it was a default judgment. Our client wasn't living in the same county anymore. Um, and she had filed an answer, or he, I'm sorry, he had filed an answer saying, I don't live there, this isn't mine, it should have been paid. Um, and so when that happened, um, I contacted the attorneys um, and let them know they were in violation of the Federal Debt Collection Practices Act because they were debt collector attorneys. They were not entitled to collect this debt. It had already been paid off. And if they did not release that judgment, I would be suing them under the FDCPA and not took care of it. Um, if in your state you don't have something similar and they are on the hook for this medical debt, um, you can still, you know, all the laws that I talked about, you can dispute it, um, you know, under either the, the federal or state debt collection statute or uh, under the credit reporting if you can say that um, this debt was obtained as a result of, you know, them being a victim of crime and harassment. Um, and physical abuse, and, and I mean, I would be shocked if your state doesn't have a CVC um, or something comparable. Um, so, but if, if that doesn't exist and they're on the hook for it, then you would have to defend it like any other debt, and possibly if, if there aren't very strong um, debtor protections in your state, then um, recommend bankruptcy. But I will say that the nice thing is that um, for purposes of credit scoring, FICO back in, I think, 2013, um, made an announcement that they would not consider medical debt anymore in their credit scoring. So even though it may appear on a report, it will not factor into their FICO credit um, score. And there are also certain laws in states. Um, so there was a, an AG opinion from New York and a couple of other states that said that credit reporting agencies cannot, the big three, so TransUnion, Experian, and Equifax, could not report medical debt um, if it was less than 180 days out. And that's because there was always issues with insurance and blah, blah, blah. blah. Um, and we have a state, uh, a state law here that governs medical reporting, so you may have something comparable in your state. Um, was that the only question, or did I have another one? Yeah, there was a follow-up, um, you know, if they are outside of the window for victim compensation, but I, I think you kind of answered that, like if your state, they're not eligible. Gotcha. I see another one on, um, sorry, my, my browser is awful, so I can't see it because it passes it, but it was on the EFTA. So does the fact that a person has online access to their bank account change when the 60-day rule starts? For example, if the bank shows a person logged into the account 15 days before they delivered the monthly statement, no. So under, um, under, under the law, it's, it's that billing statement, right? So um, you do have people that get it electronically instead of, um, uh, by paper, but it's the date of that. So like it'll say, you know, bank statement for 9-1 through 10-1-2019. So the 60 days begins to run then. Obviously, if your client finds it beforehand, they should go ahead and dispute it ASAP. Um, but, you know, obviously if they don't know that they have those protections and they come to you later on, then, um, you know, obviously argue that you can still do that. Um, okay. So I will move on with the presentation, and if there's more questions, I'll take them after this section. So you, for those of you that were probably staring at the screen while I was answering those questions, you can see um, that we had already kind of talked about these, um, but these are systematic ways to help. Um, and so if you work at law enforcement or have any, um, you know, pull there, you may consider, can we do, can we change the online disputing processes? Um, can we make it easier for people to file police reports on identity theft? Um, you know, can we make it so that they, it's safe and secure and we're not compromising their um, physical safety? Things like that. Next slide, please. And these are kind of as a closing thought. Um, you have to click more. Or, there you go. Um, so these are some, some thoughts of, um, and, and Stephanie's gonna come back and present on a toolkit that our coalition developed as part of our grant um, on coerced debt, but here are some thoughts and some ways that you all can be helping um, victims of coerced debt. So, you know, things like addressing the lease. You may have certain state protections. Um, I would be surprised if your state doesn't have any state protections for victims of domestic violence about breaking their lease or terminating their lease earlier. Um, and so addressing that, obviously, if there's debt 
that resulted um, from, from the abuse and, and violence, you can help with that. In addition to disputing it, because a lot of times, even though you follow procedure, the landlord will still try to say that you owe money and report that to consumer reporting agencies or sending it out to collections. So again, those laws um, will kick in. Um, shutting off utilities, so some of these kind of safety planning that I talked to, like preventing future coerced debt from happening, so it would be immediately and again within the context of safety considerations. Is it safe for her to do so? Will it put her, um, you know, physical, her or her children's physical safety at, at risk? But things like changing all the account information, so um, terminating cards that me, he may have and, re, um, you know, card information, credit card information, asking for new cards to be issued, um, changing passwords, addresses, phone numbers, um, you know, online things like Netflix and Hulu and iTunes and et cetera, et cetera, anything that he would have had access to in the past, even email addresses and things like that. Um, the protecting the credit is security freeze or an extended fraud alert, as the case may be, um, the prioritizing debt. So absolutely we've seen some of the like most frustrating as a practitioner um, uh, scenarios that we get is when somebody has been a victim of coerced debt and had remedies available as a victim of identity theft. And instead of availing themselves of those protections, ended up taking out another loan, like a debt consolidation loan or a payday loan to pay off those debts and now they are responsible for that payday loan or that debt consolidation loan because they did take that out, even though they didn't have to pay for all of these things. And so helping talk through that, prioritizing those debts, saying these you shouldn't pay for, these are yours, these you will need to pay for, or you know, file for bankruptcy if the case may be. Um, that non-legal advocacy that I talked about, so that's anything from financial uh, planning, um, safety planning, to helping them dispute um, that, you know, pre-suit, things like that. And then, of course, lastly, take legal action if, you, if you're able to do so. So now I'm going to um, open it up to questions and then turn it over to Stephanie if we don't have any. I don't think we have any additional that I can see. Okay, great. Then we will move it over to Stephanie. Yes, um, so now that Carla has talked about the different legal remedies um, that are available to victims of coerced debt, um, our coalition, the Texas Coalition on Coerced Debt, developed a toolkit along with our Texas Appleseed and our other partners um, to help I address identity theft um, for survivors of uh, financial abuse. And so really the goal of this toolkit was to provide something that was easy to access. Um, so it's a web-based toolkit um, you can just log on to www.financialabusehelp.org. And so it's sort of a, a one-stop shop for, for clients to be able to go there and find out about um, what coerced debt is and, and what steps that they can take um, to be able to, to fix this. And so um, the toolkit is um, really uh, divided into five different guides. Um, understand, protect, discover, um, and, and defend. And so again, the purpose is to be able to walk um, clients through what the process is um, to be able to, to fix um, um, the, the, the damage from, from the economic abuse. And the way um, I've, I tallied up some of the responses in the, that were provided in the chat box um, with regards to who was joining us, and it looks like the majority, um, about 10, of the individuals that responded are, are victim advocates. Um, four are um, attorneys or legal service providers. Um, and we did have a couple of uh, law enforcement. Um, so thank you all um, for joining us. Um, I, I, in talking with advocates, I really like to um, talk to them about how important it is um, to be able to um, empower our clients when it comes to um, their financial situation because as a result of the oftentimes physical emotional abuse um, they've really lost all power and control in the situation um, so as advocates and and service providers the last thing um, we want to do is um, bombard our clients with all of this information to where she feels um, helpless or powerless um, so we often find that in educating our clients and helping them take um, just a few uh, important steps. It really um, starts the process um, um, 
to begin to empower them again um, and to make decisions for themselves. And so sometimes what this means is um, when we talk to our clients about what the process entails to be able to dispute um, these fraudulent accounts, um, the clients may choose that perhaps now is not the time um, to, to start this process. Um, and so as part of uh, service providers, we want to be able to make sure that we're providing survivor-centered uh, services. Um, and so we want to be able to help them make an informed decision. Um, and so we want to help our clients understand, you know, this is the law, these are the protections that you can avail yourself, this is what you can do, um, how is it that we can help you, um, and if, you know, if it's not something that you are ready um, to, to be able to tackle on right now, here's the information anyways, and just come back later um, so that we can help you with this when, when you're ready. And so we find that this, this, this really does uh, work a lot. And so um, again, this is again why it's so important for us advocates to be able to describe generally what this process looks like to our clients so that they can make that informed decision. And so next slide. So the first, uh, so this is what the website looks like. Again, you just log online, it's available anywhere. Um, it does have an emergency um, exit button um, that takes you to a search page, um, just in case this is a safety precaution. Um, but generally, um, those are what the guides look like. Um, click on the next slide. Okay, um, so a common resource against across all guides is that it tries to connect uh, clients with, you know, low cost assistance, and of course the National Domestic Violence Hotline um, so that they can also make the appropriate referrals um, to um, emergency uh, victim service providers should they need that assistance. Um, so that information is on there as well. Next slide. And what's also available across these guides are, are sample forms and sample letters, uh, which we think are, are extremely helpful um, uh, to victims um, to try to simplify the process as much as possible. Um, so we just uh, published uh, this website um, a month ago, and so it's, it's brand new, um, and so we definitely would like to, to welcome input. Um, um, if you all would um, like to join our coalition, I'll have some more information on that later on, but it's um, definitely a work in progress, but I think we're all really proud of this, um, this first attempt at providing this toolkit. Um, so we're excited to share it with you all. Um, the next slide. Um, and so we talked about law enforcement and the difficulty um, that, that, that advocates and clients have in making um, a report for identity theft. Um, and so we have some resources there on, on you know, how to file a police report where we include the, the Texas Penal Code statutes um, to be able to, to provide to, to law enforcement. And um, one thing that I recommend um, is that if your um, jurisdiction allows for um, online police reporting, that really is the, the best and the easiest way to be able to uh, submit a police report. And again, like Carla mentioned, a police report is necessary so that uh, a client can avail themselves of the, of the, of the legal protections. Next slide. And so the first guy talks about um, you need to understand uh, what coerced debt. And so it takes clients through a list of questions um, to see whether or not um, they, will, they can be a, are possibly a victim of coerced debt, um, what's important to know, and uh, what are the next steps. So next slide. And those are what the questions look like. So there are questions um, such as, has an intimate partner ever pressured you to borrow money or buy something on credit when you didn't want to? Um, have you ever found out about a debt or bills that an intimate partner put in your name without you knowing? Um, has an intimate partner ever kept financial information from you? So they're just, just some of the screening um, questions as, as part of that, that, that guide that, that are important. So as an advocate, um, just asking a few questions um, to see whether or not there's a possibility um, of coerced debt can, can really go a long way to just, you know, starting to understand uh, what the problem is. Next slide. Um, so the second guide um, is protect. You, you want our clients to start taking steps to uh, protect themselves. Um, so one of the, of course, the, the most important step is that we want to ensure um, uh, 
that they, their physical immediate safety. So we, this is why as advocates, it's important to connect them to, to those resources um, when necessary. Um, we also, it also, the guide also walks clients to how to um, change all their online account information, um, how to put a credit freeze or, or a fraud alert in, in place, or, um, you know, perhaps they haven't quite left the household, um, instructions on um, starting to collect um, those important, you know, documents, personal identifying documents, um, letters from debt collectors, uh, bills, anything um, that, the, that they're going to need to help uh, fix this problem um, later on. And of course, um, there's also a section in here on, on encouraging people to file a protective order if they've been a a victim of, of domestic violence um, to also ensure um, their economic security because um, as part of a protective order, um, the, the court can make orders uh, for mutually owned or, or leased property um, or can, can order the, the, the abuser to make payments um, on, a certain, on a certain debt. Next slide. So this is just one of the, the, the steps that I had mentioned already um, that uh, the guide walks people through is uh, being able to put a credit freeze or, or fraud alert in place. Um, and so these are two ways that, um, that we can prevent uh, identity theft. And so these are placed with the credit reporting agencies and it's supposed to make it harder for somebody to, to open up a new account um, in, in, in their name. Next slide. And so these are some of the provisions um, that uh, when you file for a protective order, um, you can ask for uh, to ensure a client's economic uh, security. So again, if um, you're an advocate that's accompanying a client to uh, obtain a protective order um, or you're an attorney, um, all of these are, are things that you can ask for um, and to be able to ensure um, economic security. And one of these that I wanna highlight is um, if the abuser has had actual physical control of um, their identifying documents, like birth certificates, social security cards, um, even, well, even credit cards or debit cards, um, you can ask a judge to make that part of a, a protective order um, and to, to put that in place. And of course, um, to require, um, to prevent the abuser to not take out any new debt um, in, in their name. Next slide. So discover, um, in this guide, uh, this is guide three of the toolkit. So this guide walks clients to how to uh, pull their credit reports and how to review their credit reports to analyze for fraud. Um, next slide. And so as you can see, it links, it provides a link to annualcreditreport.com, which we recommend is the website that um, you can log on to and obtain all three credit reports. We do not recommend that you pull credit reports from, from Credit Karma or anything like that um, because they are oftentimes inaccurate. The best way to obtain a credit report is to log on to annualcreditreport.com. And so- um, now, I'm just gonna jump in real quick and um, echo what Stephanie's saying. So the tools go through the mechanics of it and I think it also explains that this is the only, um, legitimate website. It does not charge you anything. Every person is entitled to a free copy once every 12 months. And this is the government issued uh, website. The rest, um, they charge you. So any other um, report website will charge you. And as she mentioned, Credit Karma, even some that are free, don't provide a comprehensive report because they're not directly from the agency themselves. Sometimes they're what's called a tri-merged report. So it's just a summary um, of all three reports. And, and um, so it is, not as, uh, it is not what you use to dispute accounts with anyway. And it's not, you wouldn't, you have to request a block based on information that's in the report. And the only way to get those reports are through the annualcreditreport.com website. Or, um, as the toolkit mentions, if you're unable to get them online, because often with victims of identity theft, I'm sure you all know, they cannot answer the security questions because it asks about accounts that they never knew about or took out. And so in that case, you will have to request them either by phone or by mail. And so this tool walks you through how to do that. 
Right, and so as Carla mentioned, that's perhaps the biggest thing that I highlight when I work with advocates is to let the clients know um, we may not be able to pull it online, so we may have to do a written request and that may take time. Um, so again, another reason for why we want to be able to start this process as soon as possible, um, because it may take some time to, to, to be able to actually get possession of those, of those credit reports. Next slide. Um, so after uh, the guide walks us through um, um, discovering uh, the coerced debt, uh, fraudulent accounts that may have been taken out, um, the next step is to dispute and to start that dispute process. So depending on what sort of debt it is, uh, like Carla mentioned, um, there may be different uh, protections that the client may, avail, may be able to avail herself of. And so this guide walks walks a client through, okay, what are the next steps? Who do you need to contact? Uh, which credit reporting agency do you need to contact? Um, which creditor? Um, trying to figure out, okay, is this an actual debt that, that is real um, in, the, in the situation where they're being contacted by a debt collector and they're unsure um, where, this, where this debt's even coming from? Um, so, so this is a pretty in-depth guide, um, and this is also where um, it will provide those sample forms and start outlining a, a, a plan that for next steps on, on how to dispute um, all of these different debts, um, depending on what type of, uh, of debt it is. Next slide. Um, so defend is the last guide. So depending on how um, how old this this debt is, um, perhaps um, there's a pending lawsuit now. And so this this also um, walks us through what what steps to do there. It provides a link to be able to file um, a sample answer if there's if there's a pending a debt collection lawsuit. Um, some information on um, how to um, uh, contact. Uh, other legal service providers in the state of Texas. Um, it walks individuals also um, through how to, uh, what happens after they file their answer, what the, what the, what, what the um, court process looks like um, in, in a debt collection suit. And uh, lastly, what happens if, if, if they become aware that a default judgment has been taken against them? What, what, are, the, what are those uh, next steps look like? Next, next slide. So just, um, I'm also jumping in again. I know um, that, that Stephanie already mentioned this, but just to highlight it again, um, this uh, toolkit is, is Texas specific, um, especially on the defending the lawsuit and you know some of our criminal laws, but it also has the federal applicability because of the federal laws that I mentioned earlier. Um, and so it may be a good starting point for you know screening and intake and discovering and understanding and disputing. Um, those tools I think will apply you know um, nationwide, and it may be a good starting point for some of you guys that are considering doing this work. Thank you. Um, yes. Yeah, so as part of the dispute process, like Carla mentioned, like I mentioned previously, it's really important to have that identity theft report. Um, and so again, just a reminder, if you're able to do an online report, that's always the, the best way um, to go. Um, what I also recommend advocates do is if they have not yet gone to, to police to make a report uh, about the physical abuse, um, to go ahead and also make both reports at the same time if possible. Um, and all of this, you know, long term with the goal that um, if police reports are made and eventually uh, this person is charged with, for example, physical assault, the DA will be able to add on, right, that extra charge of, um, of um, you know, it being um, um, the, the theft of personal identifying information if, in fact, you know, that crime has occurred. And so that can just be an additional um, charge. Uh, against the abuser. Um, and uh, what we often hear from um, district attorneys um, that are prosecuting these cases is that they, they try to explain, well, it's really challenging to prosecute them. You know, um, economic barrier um, that's preventing them um, you know, from being able to so being able to have, for example, a pending criminal case um, as a result of, of his actions for a specific type of abuse um, really goes a long way. 
Um, and so we definitely uh, recommend that that's done as soon as possible. Next slide. And so, yes, yeah, so again, defend um, what to do that, that, that isn't yours. Um, that also links up to, like I mentioned, different uh, resources and, and to the different steps to what happens as part of the debt collection lawsuit. And next slide. So the Texas Coalition on Courts Debt, uh, which uh, Carla is the chair of, was formed in 2018, and it is funded by the Federal Office of Victims of Crime through, uh, through NITVAN, and our purpose is to promote identity theft uh, protections for survivors of family violence. So we've had um, several meetings this past year where we've been able to hear from um, advocates uh, um, uh, for uh, a victim service providers and law enforcement and other fellow attorneys throughout the state of Texas. Um, but we still have a, a long way to go. We, uh, we're, this coalition is, is brand new, um, but our, our big product this year was um, the toolkit that, that was just published. Um, next step, next slide. And so if you are in Texas, um, or even if you're not, if, you're, um, if you are a consumer law attorney, for example, um, and you take a lot of these consumer cases um, and would like referrals, um, please contact us. Please uh, join the coalition um, to get access um, to our training and, and, and to our experts. And, and that's the email right there. So anybody have any questions about that? I think that's pretty much it. Time for questions. Yeah, and um, just so you all know if you have questions that maybe was outside of the scope of the presentation today, but relating to economic abuse um, or some of those policy questions, whatever it is, um, are in the next slide. Um, our contact information is there, so you can either email Stephanie or myself or both. Um, and it is my understanding that you guys in the next couple of days will get a copy of, of this PowerPoint, so you can refer back to it. Um, and please let us know, especially if you have any input about the toolkit, if you find there are certain things that would make it better. Also, please let us know because it's something that, um, you know, we're constantly wanting to, to update and to, to keep, um, you know, useful and relevant for all folks that work in this space. All right. Well, thank you so much, to Carla and Stephanie, for spending the time sharing this really uh, valuable information with us. Um, I don't see any more questions coming in, so happy to let everyone go a little bit early. Um, but like they said, their uh, email addresses are up there and we will be emailing out a PDF of the PowerPoint along with a link to the recording of this webinar, uh, probably tomorrow, but by the end of the week for sure. So thank you to our presenters and to everybody else for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed it and have a great day. Thank you all.